We're turning our attention to the Word of God, to Titus chapter 2, again this morning. Uh, And as we uh, consider verses 4 and 5 in particular, uh, we've recognised already today uh, that these words cut across what our culture teaches us, uh, that uh, these words don't fit with the way our world thinks, uh, and that uh, they challenge the way uh, that for 50 years, for 100 years, for four, five, six, eight thousand years, men and women have related together. And so as we look at Titus chapter 2, the question we have to grapple with is, is Christianity bad for women? Uh, Does the, uh, the scriptures, do they teach something that makes uh, women second-class citizens? Uh, a lot of people see uh, religions of all kinds uh, as a set of rules, usually a set of rules designed to control people. Uh, rules made up usually by men to organise the way that people live. Uh, And our culture, though, says that that is not good for us, Uh, that there is a much better way to live than following the rules and expectations that people have for us. Uh, Robin Williams, the actor, once said, there are no rules, just follow your heart. Uh, An idea that we hear all over the place uh, in our day. Uh, But where does... Uh, Where does that leave us? Uh, If we uh, simply do uh, what our hearts call us to do, do we experience the freedom our world promises? Uh, If we uh, live following our own hearts, I think your experience is probably the same as mine, uh, that following your heart leaves you dissatisfied in the end. Uh, that everything our hearts promise us leaves us short. Uh, there's a, a saying about uh, the, the, the bread that, that you eat turning to gravel in your mouth. I think that's the experience each of us has as we say, well, I'll lay aside what God's word says and I will do what pleases me instead. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote, Uh, in his book, Mere Christianity, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Uh, And that's what Christianity teaches us. As our hearts lead us to all sorts of solutions to satisfy us, Christianity... Uh, The teaching of the Lord Jesus shows us something that does satisfy. Uh, Not uh, a set of rules given by powerful people to control others. But in the Christian faith, we find the promises of God to meet our greatest needs at the greatest cost for his greatest glory. Just think about that for a moment. That is a world away from a book full of rules, isn't it? That God himself makes promises to us to meet our greatest need, the forgiveness of our sin and a life free from its punishment, to meet our greatest need at the greatest cost, the cost of his son for his greatest glory. Uh, Jesus shows that to be true, including in his interactions with women. In John chapter 4, uh, he speaks to a woman uh, at a well in Samaria. Uh, a woman who had been looking for meaning and purpose and intimacy and fulfilment anywhere that she could find it. And again and again and again, her relationships let her down. Husband number one, two, three, none of them could satisfy that longing. And what does Jesus say to her? Does he quote the seventh commandment to her as he rightly could have done? 
He does convict her on the issue of adultery. But what he is aiming to get across is in John 4, 13 and 14. That everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus will say later in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But what Jesus came to do was different. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so the only way to have true life is not to follow our hearts. It is to receive life. From Jesus. Anywhere else we turn for fulfilment and life is really stealing and killing and destroying us, even if it takes time to do so. But in Christianity, we find not a set of rules that hopefully will make us good enough, but we find God's promise to meet our greatest need at the greatest cost for his greatest glory. My aim today then is to convince you of this truth, that the gospel gives women endless fulfilment in loving God and others. And I can say that because it gives everyone fulfilment in loving God and others, young or old, men or women. But when our world says Christianity is bad news for women, We need to come to God's word and hear his gospel promises that tell us something different. Uh, That there is nothing more worthwhile for us to know and love Jesus, to say no to our hearts and yes to him. And there are older women here who can show us that and can tell us that from their own experience. And the gospel gives younger women endless encouragement to ask those questions. And as I've just said, it's true whether we're young or old, whether we're women or men. In fact, what of uh, most of what we've seen here in chapter two will be repeated again at the start of chapter three for all Christians. So whether you don't put yourself in the category of young or whether you're a man rather than a woman, there is still a truth here for you today uh, that the gospel fulfills us in ways that following our heart never can. Come with me then into Titus chapter 2, as we remind ourselves, see again, see afresh how in the gospel Jesus satisfies us in the way we can never achieve elsewhere. Now, first of all, in in verses 4 and 5, I see how fulfilling it is to live in gospel love. In fact, I'll read verses 3 to 5. Uh, again, So we can see the connection between the life of an older Christian woman and what they're to teach those who are younger. From verse 3, we see, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Uh, Notice again, uh, Titus is not instructed to teach the young women personally and directly. Uh, The example here that that women need should come from other older godly women. And we see again the principle we recognised last time as we saw what these words say to older Christian women, that the more we learn about the gospel and godliness, the better equipped we should be to help others. That the more progress we make in knowing God and in loving Jesus, 
the more passionate we should be for others to grow as well. The more we know shouldn't make us proud. Uh, Learning more shouldn't make us critical, should make us humble and helpful and useful, especially in the lives of of younger Christians. So notice uh, the first way uh, that older women are to teach younger women is in how to love. Uh, Now, no one is saying that that a young woman can't love without being given a you know, 10-week course on how to do that. Uh, the word to, to teach here is a very practical word. It's about showing how it's done, showing the best way to do it. Uh, it's the answer to the question, well, what's the best way to love my husband and my kids? And there's a reality here, isn't there? Uh, that the emotional rush that people have when they start dating or uh, early in their married life doesn't always last the long term. Uh, that an emotional, uh, the emotional fuel for marriage often dies down, often needs to be replenished and isn't enough to sustain a relationship. Uh, neither can having shared interests in, oh, well, we like to do these same things together. Now, eventually, love, real love, sacrificial love, is going to be what keeps the relationship going, or it will not last. Because, I don't think I'm revealing any secrets here, one day you'll realise that you're married to a sinner, and you'll realise that they are too that they will sin against you, you will sin against them. And then the real question comes, will you repent? Will you forgive? Will you actually love when it costs? When it's not just a feeling. We all need help to base our marriages on, on love. There might be someone who's taught you how to do that, who's shown you how to do that. I wonder if there's someone you could teach, someone you could help to love their husband or their children. Now, see, parenting doesn't come naturally either, does it? Uh, Some men and women are very warm and caring towards children, and that's wonderful. But loving our kids also doesn't just mean having fun with them letting them have what they want. But neither is parenting just squashing them until they do things the way we would. So there are a whole lot of miniature versions of ourselves running around in the world. Uh, If we have children, then loving them means introducing them to the God who loves them, helping them to follow Jesus. And again... I wonder who could teach you to love your kids that way or who you could teach. But see, this is not a crushing, controlling, dominating caricature, little distortion of Christianity that our world often serves up. It's a life of love. But then it gets controversial, doesn't it? As we look a little further down the passage to verse 5, we're told that not only are uh, women to love their husbands and children, but in the middle of verse 5, they are to be subject to their husbands or submissive to their own husbands. Uh, Notice again, Paul doesn't tell Titus directly to demand the submission of women. It is not husbands who are told to make their wives submit to them. Older women are to show the goodness of that in their lives because that's what God calls us to. That submission is not doing anything and everything that your husband wants. That is not what it means. 
Uh, It is a military word. It's about soldiers being arranged together to carry out their mission. Uh, It is about order, about putting our efforts and energies together to a coordinated need and purpose rather than one going one way and one going another. Eventually, you'll pull apart like that. Submission is to work together under a leader, yes, but working together on a common goal. And in fact, all Christians, we saw last Sunday in Ephesians 5, all Christians are called to submit. In fact, I think we saw it again in 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3, weren't we? Uh, The example of submission is not a master and a slave, but the church submitting to Christ. The example of leadership is not a mighty king who has all of his demands met. The example of a husband leading his home is of Christ denying himself. Dying for those he loves. Men and women are distinct with different roles that complement each other, equal in value to the God who made them. As Genesis 1.27 says, both male and female were made in his image. And in the gospel, together we show the love of Christ for his people and the submission of his people to their saviour. It should be a beautiful picture. A willing, loving display of gospel love. Not a, a crushing, destroying demand. Gospel love is costly, of course. Love always costs. But Jesus promises to younger women and to all of us that gospel love will fulfil us in ways that worldly love never can. Now, I could just stand here and say, love people like Jesus did, and that needs some explanation, doesn't it? Uh, What will it actually look like? We'll look uh, particularly at verse 5. Our second point uh, shows us how uh, the gospel gives us priorities. Uh, Living this way of loving Jesus will change what comes first for us. And very practically, again, some quite controversial words at the end of, uh, in the start of verse 5 that younger women need to be taught to be busy at home. Again, these are the sorts of verses that have uh, preachers diving for their, uh, their helmets as they step into the pulpit. But uh, these are good and godly and loving words. Are they not the opinions of Paul or Peter or of, of controlling Christian leaders, these are God's words. They're telling us that for a Christian woman, the first priority is to look after your home. It's, it has been well said that every occupation exists so that homemakers exist. And I think that's right. Now that to keep a home To care for a husband, to love children, is the most important thing anyone can be called to do. To be a CEO or an entrepreneur, to make a a billion dollars, I don't think is nearly as important as caring for a family. And the scriptures are very clear. This doesn't mean a woman can't have a job. Uh, In Acts 16, verse 14... Uh, Lydia was a merchant selling purple cloth. Or in Acts 18, the opening couple of verses, Aquila and his wife Priscilla were both 
tent makers. They had a trade, both of them. Or you look at the example, the ideal woman in the end of Proverbs, Proverbs 31. Uh, She is not commended simply for sitting at home doing the washing. She works with her hands. She provides for her family. She buys a field. She plants a vineyard. She trades and makes a profit from the trade. She sells garments that she makes and she manages the household finances. She is not there reading novels all day or watching Netflix, waiting for her husband to come home. But wherever women direct their attention and their energy, God calls them to put the home first and not to use all of their energy outside and give the family their leftovers. A godly woman can do great things in business, in the community, but her priority is to be busy at home. And we'll only learn that from the gospel. Uh, you, you might be thinking just how outdated this seems. Uh, our culture says to us that your value comes from what you do. If you don't have a job, you aren't working. I can't remember which, which American president, his wife was criticised for never having worked a day in her life. She'd raised five children. She'd never worked a day in her life. you believe that? That's how our world sees this. It says that your identity comes from what you produce, from what you do. Your value comes from what you achieve. But God tells us something different. He says that your identity isn't from what you do or you used to do. It comes from Christ, what Jesus has done for you. Later, down in verse 14, we're told that if Jesus has saved you, you are a people of his very own. Or or another translation says you are his treasured possession. That's your identity if you are in Christ. If you trust in Jesus to save you, that is who you are. Whatever you do for work, whatever your family circumstances even. And in fact, we see through the Bible that making a home is something that God does. Making a home is not something unimportant. It's something that God did. We're told in Genesis of God creating the world, but specifically he planted a garden. He didn't only say there will be trees in my world, there will be plants in my world, he planted a garden for Adam in Genesis 2. And when God removed Adam and Eve from that home because of their sin, he promised a way back. Not through the achievements of Adam in creating a civilization, but through the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Genesis 3, 15. And so keeping a home and caring for family was essential for God's people to be saved and for the promised saviour to come. That's why people of faith, like Abraham, realised they were strangers on earth. In Hebrews 11 verse 16 we're told, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Jesus himself came saying he was going away to make a home for his people in John 14. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. In the final chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 22, we see that God himself makes a home with his people. 
In Revelation 22, verse 3, we read, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Brothers and sisters especially, making a home is not an unimportant job. It reflects a priority God himself has. It shows what God is doing in the gospel. Making a home for his people forever. What an amazing thing to show to a homeless, broken world. Now, I've already said that that this is not where our world looks for meaning, though, and for purpose. Uh, That our culture points to our achievement to find our value. What you do is how important you are. It tells us loving others and making a home. That really doesn't fit in. So where will we find the desire for this? Brings us to our third point, also in verse 5. We've seen again and again uh, the importance of character. The, The truth of the opening verse of this letter, that as our faith grows... The more we know the truth, the more we will live godly lives. It's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. See, we would normally be squeezed into our world's way of thinking. The only way to avoid that is to actively present our minds to God. In response to his mercy to say, I will hear and listen to you, not to the world around me. That's how, as we see down in verses 11 and 12 of of Titus chapter 2, that God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to live self-controlled lives. The more we get the gospel, the more we see the love of Jesus, the more we will bask in God's mercy and live a different life. So what shape will that have for a young Christian woman? How can older women encourage younger women to live? How can Christian brothers encourage Christian women to live? Well, the gospel will shape the way she relates inwards, Upwards and outwards. And to be self-controlled and pure and to be kind. Just those couple of sections from verse 5 we haven't looked at yet. To be self-controlled and pure and to be kind. Uh, Looking in, God calls Christian women to be self-controlled. In fact, he's called every group so far to self-control. Young and old, men and women. It's the opposite of self-indulgence, where we say, well, I'll do what I want, I deserve it. It remembers I only deserve God's wrath, but in the gospel he generously gives me grace. Self-control is essential. Without self-control, all we have are good intentions. Looking up, God calls Christian women to be pure, or holy, other translations say. Uh, It's remembering that we belong to him. That God has bought us with the precious blood of his son. Uh, It's the opposite of that self-righteousness that says, I'll be good enough if I try hard enough. Instead, the gospel calls us 
to devote ourselves to God, to sanctify ourselves. And looking out, then God calls Christian women to be kind. And now, some women by temperament and personality are caring and gentle. But true, lasting kindness comes from the heart, doesn't it? A kindness that actually seeks the best for someone else is more than some nice manners and a soft voice. It's the opposite of selfishness, actually doing good to others. Now, that's how the gospel changes the the heart motivation, the character of Christian women. Looking up, uh, sorry, looking in with self-control, looking up with purity, looking out with kindness. Because we're looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus, our great God and Saviour. That's what he's called in verses 13 and 14 that all of this would just be a set of moral instructions if it was not for the good news of Jesus. That he has appeared once already to offer salvation to all people. And in verse 13, that he will appear again. Our blessed hope that our Saviour will come. The one who has already redeemed us from all wickedness to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Well, let me tie all those pieces together in conclusion this morning. The gospel gives younger women, and in fact all of us, endless fulfilment in loving God and others. We cannot find lasting fulfilment anywhere else. And that's why godly women should show each other to love their family and prioritise their home. Because God calls us to honour him, not ourselves. If we seek fulfilment outside in our achievements or inside by following our desires, we will be dissatisfied. You can guarantee it. But in the gospel, Jesus has given up everything for us. And the gospel teaches us, if we're women or men, if we're young or old, to come to Jesus who gives us living water. To come to Jesus who gives life to the fullest. To find our satisfaction in Jesus Christ, our great God and Saviour. He gave himself for us to make us his own. He will never let us down. And that's why we can be eager to do what is good. We need his help to do that, don't we? So we'll come in prayer to him again this morning. Let's pray. Our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we thank you that in your gospel You teach us to say no to ourselves, to our hearts, to the encouragements of our world and the temptations of the devil. That you call us to live not pressed into the pattern of current thinking, but to come to your word, to see your gracious promises to women and men together in the gospel. To see how through family life you brought our saviour into the world. To show us how to live in submission to him who is the king and head of the church. To teach us to relate in a way that is self-controlled and holy and kind. We pray particularly uh, that together we would learn uh, to live in the light of the gospel that the formal times of teaching, preaching and instruction would help and equip us, that our own personal conversations one-on-one afterwards and in Bible studies and through the week would build and equip and strengthen your church, that together we would live in a way 
that matches the gospel, that shows our world that although what we say, what we teach, what we believe is, is not popular, that it is good, that it is loving and not controlling, that it is for the ultimate fulfilment of women and men, that each one of us would have the abundant life Jesus promises us and that our neighbours and friends and family would desire that too. We ask it there now, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.